Uh, hello and good evening here from the UFA once Thank more. You. It's all good. It is all paid. <laughs> um, I have the pleasure to um, open the what is already the eighth of our Ukraine lectures in this series. And our speaker today is a colleague from the NIA, the Dutch Center for War and Holocaust. And Holocaust. And genocide. And genocide. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, Karel Berghoff um, has <coughs> studied history um, and uh, Russian studies here uh, at the UFA. He has written his PhD thesis at the University of Toronto. And um, his book on the German occupation regime is obviously um, the one that made him the expert to invite if the topic is the history of Ukraine in the Second World War. I think we do not have to explain uh, or go a long way explaining why this is a very relevant topic. You all know that Putin uh, and other Russian leaders are constantly pointing to um, the alleged or real Nazi past of Ukraine and the Nazi hangover in the present day Ukraine. Um, so we thought it would be a good idea to have somebody um, here, who is an expert on the period and can help us finding our way through Ukraine's history during um, the Second World War. So, Karel, 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 I think the floor is yours or the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, for the invitation. I think it's a wonderful initiative to have this lecture series. Um, so, uh, Wait until we have the full screen. So this is obviously my topic, <laughs> Ukraine during World War II. And the uh, only thing I need to know is how to move to the next slide. And that will be with that one. Okay. Right. So um, I'm just going to give you an overview of the events rather than the post-war mythologies, which of course I'm happy to discuss, but I thought let's just line out what I think happened and what was important. And do tell me if I don't speak clearly enough. It has been a while since I addressed a room where people are actually sitting that far away from me. Uh, all right. So um, Ukraine during the Second World War. First of all, it began with the addition of what we now call Western Ukrainian regions to the Soviet Union uh, in August of 1939. Uh, I'm sorry. The Soviet Union and the Third Reich, Nazi Germany, as you know, signed a non-aggression treaty that became known as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. It included a secret clause that, became, that divided Poland into Soviet and German spheres in the event of war. And that war came just days later, when on September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland and uh, on the 17th of the same month, the Soviet Union invaded the same country, Poland, from the east and annexed its eastern half and then proclaimed there the so-called reunification of Western Ukraine and Western Belarus with the Ukrainian and Belarusian pre-existing Soviet republics. So this way, Western Volhynia and Eastern Galicia became six oblasts or provinces in an enlarged Soviet Ukraine. And within the course of the next year, Stalin added Ukrainian inhabited parts of Romania, northern Bukovina and southern Bessarabia, also to Soviet Ukraine. Now, the incorporation of Soviet Ukraine's new territories amounted to a violent Sovietization that included deportations, eastward of hundreds of thousands of so-called class enemies, and those enemies included Poles in particular, but also Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Jews. So when the German large-scale invasion began in June 1941, the Soviet Union had illegally enlarged the Ukrainian Soviet Republic fairly recently through annexation from Poland and Romania of these regions, let's repeat, Western Volhynia, Eastern Galicia, Northern Bukovina, and Southern Bessarabia. 
The Soviet retreat in 1941 was extremely brutal. Just to give you one example, for the entire territory of the 1941 Soviet Ukrainian SSSR uh, Republic, Soviet documents state that during this evacuation, 8,789 prisoners were executed in the prisons. Without any further ado. Okay, so now it's time to progress and show you the first real slide. Uh, after an initial period of military rule, the largest German territorial unit became the Reichskommissariat Ukraine, which you see over here. It had its headquarters in Livne, in the, in the northwest, and it was led by a Reichskommissar Erich Koch. It had five large districts, as you can see here on the map. Crimea itself was not included. In the north, it included some regions that today are part of Belarus. Meanwhile, the city of Lviv, Lviv, Lemberg, and the rest of Eastern Galicia was made part of a new district, the Galicia district, within a German territory called the General Government, General Gouvernement. The Galicia district was subdivided into counties and under a governor called Lash at first and then Otto Wächter. Of course, there was the German army. The German army had a rear army area south in the far eastern military zone of occupation, and that also had its rulers. And finally, Subcarpathian Rus or Transcarpathia continued to be ruled by Hungary, which had annexed it in 1939. Now, what about plans that the Nazis had and their policies? Ukraine was very important in Nazi plans, for it belonged to the so-called Lebensraum or living space that the Germans supposedly needed in order to survive. Uh, Ukraine's fertile lands would enable them to revitalize their agrarian roots and thus regenerate themselves as a Germanic race. And moreover, the produce from there would foster the Reich's economic independence. Except for the ethnic Germans, the so-called Volksdeutsche, not just Jews, but the entire native population, sooner or later, would have to be removed from an East where ultimately only people of pure German blood would live. So what was the result of a, a, a geology uh, like this? Well, it's very clear, and I'm not surprising you, I think. Life and death under Nazi rule was brutal and full of fear. Terror took many forms, plunder, eviction from homes, deportations, and above all, the mass murder of Jews, Roma, people with mental disabilities, prisoners of war, communists, Soviet activists, and other suspects. The killings were often carried out for everyone to see. A wide range of German security units amply used their unbridled license to kill. These units include commandos of the Einsatzgruppe C and Einsatzgruppe D, which were the two large task forces of the security police and security service. But besides these mobile killing squads, which later became the local offices of the security police, there were also nine battalions of the regular German order police, regular police. The first SS infantry brigade of the Waffen SS and three army security divisions. Numerous camps were created, such as Suretz in Kiev and Janowska in Lviv. Never before in the history of Ukraine did so many social and ethnic groups suffer so much during one single period, with the possible exception of the time of the Great Famine of 1933. For most of the inhabitants of the new Reichskommissariat Ukraine, conditions were far worse than anywhere else in Western Europe, but also far worse than in this Galicia district. But let's not forget, uh, well, let's, let's not over-exaggerate the difference. Galicia, the territory you're seeing now, was also littered with no corpses and mass graves. So was this rear army area south, to which the Donbass, Donetsk Basin, and Crimea belonged, and which did not have a German civilian administration. In fact, 
No military occupation regime in European history had ever been as brutal as this one. In, in uh, short, it was uh, extremely brutal all over Ukraine. The German armed forces in the military zone of occupation were responsible also for mass crimes, mainly because the Wehrmacht had become thoroughly Nazified and its leader, la leaders largely shared Hitler's views on Jews and Slavs. That's not all. The Romanians. Two southern Ukrainian regions were fully rejoined with the Romanian state, northern Bukovina with Genovese, Genovese, uh, I hope you find it. It's uh, not indicated uh, very well here. I see it up in the middle, uh, 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 up north, Chernivtsi, and the Bessarabian south of today's Odessa Oblast. So Odessa was under Romanian rule. Other southwestern Ukrainian regions between the southern Bukh and Dniester rivers became uh, not a part of Romania, but became a separate entity, Transnistria. As you see it on the right, Transnistria Governorate. Govern uh, govern Formally, this was separate from the Romanian state, but this entity, uh, uh, and, and this entity included, as you see, Odessa. It consisted of 13 districts and it had its own governor, Alexianu. It, had, it was, a, again, a place full of terror and fear. It had about 200 ghettos concentration camps and penal labor camps. The most lethal of those were in the Holter district where Romanians joined by Ukrainians and ethnic German policemen carried out mass shootings. Let's focus a little bit more on the victims groups. These, as I said, were mainly Jews, Roma, people with mental disabilities and prisoners of war. On the eve of the Second World War, about 5% of Soviet Soviet Ukraine's population was of Jewish descent. And by the middle of 1941, about 2.7 million Jews were living in the borders of present day Ukraine. As that, I mean, of course, the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine. During the German led war against the Soviet Union, a stunning proportion of them, some one and a half million, died at the hands of Germans, as well as Romanians, Hungarians, Ukrainians, and others. In all, about 60% of the pre-war Jewish population of Ukraine was murdered. Some 900,000 of Jews had fled or were evacuated to the East in time, mostly from the industrialized East and the Dnieper Band. But in Ukraine's Western regions, the Jewish communities of Galicia, Volhynia, and Podolia were exterminated almost in full. Overall, only about 100,000 Jews survived in Ukraine while it was under Nazi rule. So let's describe this a little. Soon after the invasion began in late June 1941, growing proportions of Jews were murdered. It struck first able bodied men, early July, then Jews among the prisoners of war, the middle of July, and then also women and children from late August 1941. Although some individual SS officers had begun shooting Jewish women and children, the expansion of the shootings into these broader categories was driven from the top, mainly by the higher SS and police leader for Russia South, Friedrich Jekyll. But it's little known, and that's why it's nice that we still have this slide, it's little known that Romania initially acted even more radically in the zones that the Romanians occupied at first from the very start, while Germans were focusing on Jewish men, in little known Bukovinian and Bessarabian places, the Romanian invaders shot not only Jewish men, but also women and children. They were first. When talking about Ukraine during the Second World War, the word Pogroms is never far away, so let's just talk a little bit about that. Pogroms can be defined as spontaneous or seemingly spontaneous acts of anti-Jewish violence by locals. In Ukraine, they erupted in June and July 1941, soon after the start of the German invasion. In regions of Western Ukraine that less than two years before had been occupied by the Soviet Union. <clears throat> 
Thousands of Jews were killed in pogroms in numerous localities, including the cities of Lviv and Ternopil. Principal responsibility remained with the invaders who wanted, who wanted and encouraged such pogroms, but nevertheless, radical Ukrainian nationalists were involved, if only because of the propaganda they issued themselves. In V, for instance, the poster was put up, and the next day, a pogrom by all kinds of perpetrators began, and it climaxed in the German shooting of hundreds of Jews. After the pogroms, they were in Ukraine, so not, no longer just talking again about Western Ukraine. After the pogroms, there were in all of Ukraine some 2,000 German murder actions. The word action was always used by the perpetrators themselves, so you have to be a bit careful. Realize it's a euphemism, of course. So I say German murder actions. They took the form of shootings of large and small groups of Jews. The transition toward these mass shootings took place at a breathtaking speed. An important watershed here was the mass shooting of 23,600 Jews in the town of Kamenets Budilski, a town near the pre-1939 border between Poland and Romania. That massacre showed that Germans would murder Jewish communities entirely. Kiev, uh, which we like to spell these days a little differently, why I, Kiev became the first large city anywhere in Europe where virtually all its Jewish inhabitants that had remained were murdered in a single stroke, mainly on two days, September 29th, and September 30th, 1941. Less than a week before, mines that had been deliberately placed by the retreating NKVD and the Red Army began to explode, and those set off a fire that demolished most of the city center. The murder took place at the ravine called Babin or Babi Jar. Here you see one photograph of a range of photos taken almost immediately afterward of remains from the victims. Here you see the key perpetrators, uh, two representing the Nightsets group on the left, and um, Friedrich Jekyll is the one representing uh, the regular police. The, 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 the global was hanged, uh, Rush died of illness, and Jekyll was also hanged uh, in, in the Baltics. This is the ravine immediately afterwards. So if you see the immense scale and you see prisoners covering and sort of tidying up the, the, the killing site. In a similar development, the Romanian occupiers killed about 25,000 Jews in Odessa in two days in October 1941. Again, after the Soviet mine, uh, they are killed Romanians. It became even worse, so to speak, in the second half of 1942, when a second and final wave of mass shootings began, moving from eastern to western Ukraine and murdering the remaining Jews. Here, eastern Galicia stood out. In this district of the general government, mass shootings also occurred late in the war, and its Jews were also deported, uh, eventually gassed in the death camp Belshitz. Ukraine had its Jewish ghettos, places where Jews were concentrated with restrictions on entry and departure, and they were clearly meant to fully isolate and then kill them. They mostly existed in Eastern Galicia and Bolivia, and mostly were set up by the German army. Besides the ghettos, there were numerous forced labor camps. Growing international awareness of these shootings and the diminishing prospects of a German victory in the war prompted a Nazi effort to destroy the evidence, that is, the corpses of the dead. A special commando forced prisoners then to unearth the mass graves and to burn the Jewish and non-Jewish victims. But this policy could not be fully implemented, so not all the mass graves were uncovered. This was all about Jews, mostly, but also there are the Roma, formerly known as gypsies. They were also exterminated for racist reasons. Um, the treatment of all Roma merged with that of the Jews, and that was particularly initiated in the south 
uh, in Crimea by Einstein's Group D. Then again, we also had people with mental disabilities also systematically murdered in Kiev, for instance, first the Jews among them and then the others, about 800 in total. The other large group killed in the German massacres were the Soviet prisoners of war, a term which can be a bit misleading because some of these prisoners did not consider themselves Soviet, and they actually included many who were not formerly soldiers, uh, like so-called People's Levy, Narodnia, Pochenia, railroad, railroad workers, and so on. Let's just compare for a moment. French, British, American, and Canadian military men in German captivity were extremely likely to survive their captivity, even if they were of Jewish descent. In stark contrast, a staggering number of persons considered to be Soviet POWs died in German captivity in Ukraine and beyond. And about a third did so while being still near the front line. The number of dead for Ukraine and its neighbors is between 2.8 and 3 million. And for Ukraine, it probably lay between 700,000 and 1 million. Almost always Jews among these prisoners were immediately shot and meanwhile, from the Nazi perspective, the others in principle could be useful for the moment, these Slavs. And that explains why many POWs identified as Ukrainian often were released, especially in 1941. Here, unofficial Red Cross societies played an important role. But still, many soldiers of the German army, the Wehrmacht, evidently assumed that Bolshevism had somehow irreversibly infected all these soldiers whom they called Russians, regardless of their actual ethnic background. And in this Nazified frame of mind, such Russians were either superfluous or actually very, very dangerous. So not only guidelines and orders such as the infamous Commissar order played a role, so did real racism combined regulations and racism created an unmistakable scenario, the deliberate destruction of most of the Soviet POWs. After the initial shootings of some uh, of a proportion of uh, prisoners at each occasion, the prisoners were marched west westward via transit camps toward permanent camps, often for very long distances. These are best described actually as death marches for German and Hungarian army escorts, shot on site fugitives and stragglers, and mostly prevented, prevented locals from giving the prisoners food or water. Because the harvest of 1941 was actually quite good, the German authorities and the native population did have plenty of food to spare. I think I was the first to show this on the basis of documents. The latter, so the locals, really tried to, to pass on this food, but German policymakers wanted most of the prisoners to die. They deliberately starved the numerous POWs who could not work. Feeding non-working POWs was even proclaimed wrong-headed humanity. Camp guards often shot at civilians who tried to save lives. In total, I think it's clear that hundreds of thousands of lives of these men and some women, by the way, could and would have been saved if those civilians had not been obstructed so much and if the escorts and the camp guards had behaved in a more humane fashion. Let's talk about peasants. Here you see an office of uh, administrators of a farm in place called Periaslav. Peasants who have not been members of the Soviet collective farm now had to join its, German, uh, join its German successor, the communal farm. They also noticed that the regulations on how long they had to work became very strict. Machine tractor station now became basis for supervision and these supervisors, Germans some Dutch and others, including Ukrainians, these supervisors tended to be ruthless and tended to force the peasants to work 
even on important holidays. Worst of all for the peasants was the fact that Germans beat the peasants for the smallest things, such as not saying a proper greeting, not doing it at once, and so on. But paradoxically, many peasants under German rule, on average, had more food at their disposal in, the, in these years than they used to have under Soviet rule. They had more to eat for themselves. And why was this? This was mainly because they worked their own gardens well, and because for a long time, the German system of supervision and requisition was less efficient than its Soviet predecessor. Still, for them, for these peasants of the Germans, the main problem was that what now had come, despite their better food situation, was to them full-blown serfdom. The ever-increasing abuse and violence were why eventually most peasants feared for their lives whenever there was even a German around. And moreover, the girls and women among them knew they could be arrested and rounded up and forced to work somewhere in an army brothel. City dwellers. Terror and shortages of food again were the key elements. In the cities, passers-by could also be forced to watch public hangings of those somehow labeled saboteurs or Jews. People would see so-called gas vans speeding by, uh, mobile gas chambers. Shots resounded from many killing sites, such as Babin Yar, down to the very end of Nazi rule. And of course, in daily life, city dwellers encountered overt anti-Slavic racism. Germans never stood in line. They always could claim a seat in the trams. There were insults, Russische Schwein, uh, and often abuse, beatings, even for misunderstanding something. And uh, besides all this, it was really hard to make a living, particularly for people working, uh, say, with documents, intellectuals, uh, for instance, in early 1942, all institutions of higher education were closed in the Reichskommissariat in Korea. As if this was not bad enough, in the first winter, there was a major famine in various places, in particular in Crimea, in which perhaps thousands of civilians starved to death, and in Kiev and Kharkiv, where a large numbers starved to death, starved to death in what I actually call artificial famines. You think you know about the famine of 1933, that was an artificial, well, I'm telling you, Besides the Soviet prisoners of war, these people were also deliberately starved. These famines were foreseeable and deliberately created by the German authorities, so as to get rid of human beings considered useless or dangerous. There was plenty of food around the cities, even late in late 1941, and the peasants were eager to barter with the proceeds of their rich harvest. But police cordons, here you see an example, were set up with the express purpose of confiscating what was called surplus food. Everything actually was confiscated usually. And peasants and city dwellers often were blocked from venturing into or out of urban centers. Such blockades, of course, were not total, but they cost many lives. I think the estimate death toll for Kiev is probably 10,000 artificial deaths. The main victim here is the city of Kharkiv in the east. For a long time, that city remained very close to the front, only 50 kilometers away. It was the largest Soviet city ever occupied by the Germans. It had about half a million inhabitants, and the Germans ruled it until August 1943. What did they want? The city commander demanded extreme harshness toward the locals. It's on paper, he says it. And he had no interest whatsoever, I'm quoting, in feeding these people. So as a result, at least 30,000 Kharkivans starved to death. I think no other city in Europe occupied by the Germans, German armed forces, uh, had what, um, there was no other such city in German occupied Europe where so many people who were not Jewish suffered and then died from famine. 
deportations. Early in 1942, in the wake of already extremely terrible events, these mass shootings and this winter of hunger, the German authorities launched a campaign to obtain laborers for factories and farms in Germany. They had not anticipated this before the war, but now they felt the need to alleviate the shortages, the labor shortages that had not been expected in greater Germany. Initially, no, not initially, they provided some financial assistance uh, to family members of the so-called Ostarbeiter, Eastern workers, as they were called. But then what turned out, the working conditions of these people were actually terrible and this news spread rapidly. And as a result, many Ukrainians became actually terrified of being sent to Germany. Uh, in response, many people actually began to mutilate themselves so as to disqualify themselves from this deportation. Some people were convinced that they would die in Germany from famine or from Allied bombs later in the war. And they began, even began to doubt, are the Germans really only murdering Jews in Roma? When there were no more volunteers, the Germans sent out commissions to carry out deportations. Local administrators in Ukraine were threatened with death if they would not supply the assigned total of so-called recruits. From late 1942, native officials uh, no, no longer even should apply a certain number of people, but simply order the deportation of all persons of a specific age. <clears throat> not just German policemen, but also rayon leaders, city mayors, and extraordinary policemen started to arrest people uh, for deportation. Roundups became a, fine, a frequent phenomenon at city markets. Those who tried to escape from them were shot at. In the countryside, the police simply went from house to house. Still frustrated, the regime took even harsher actions, ordering, for instance, the burning of the homes of those who refused to go, confining relatives to labor camps as hostages, and uh, indeed burning entire villages. The boarding of the deportation trains also produced highly violent and emotional scenes. More and more auxiliary policemen, who now realized that Germany was probably losing the war, began issuing warnings. I see something in my screen. Are you seeing the same? <laughs> uh, began to issue warnings that the roundups were coming up and sometimes began to help people to escape. Thank you. Ultimately, one in every 40 inhabitants of the Reichskommissariat and rear army area south combined were deported by August 1943. Ultimately, one and a half million people from these two Ukrainian regions ended up in Germany. Mostly were villagers. Uh, but definitely it's true that the deportations affected almost every single family in Ukraine. Now, of course, you want to know about what some people call collaboration. I call it auxiliaries. auxiliaries. There was in the Reichskommissariat Ukraine the so-called Ukrainian Auxiliary Administration, Ukrainische Hilfsverwaltung. It, what did they mean? This meant city administrations, headed by a mayor, rayon administrations headed by a rayon chief, and village administrations headed by a village elder, the starosta. They played a very important role under the German occupation, if only because the invader initially lacked detailed knowledge of local affairs. But let's uh, emphasize also, there was never a single body authorized to represent the Ukrainian population as a whole in the Reichskommissariat of Ukraine. Comparing this to Galicia, the, the district of Galicia in the general government, we have to see that the Ukrainians there in this respect were slightly better off. They had a local branch of the Ukrainian Central Committee based in Krakow. Other kinds of auxiliaries were the police. The earliest local police were formations uh, particularly in Western Ukraine, that were calling, that called themselves militias. They had little, there was even little or no German involvement in them at the start. But after a while, the Einsatzgruppen or the German army 
reduce their size, the number of members, I mean, and began to expel many members of uh, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists. Eventually, in the Reichskommissariat alone, there were eventually about 80,000 such policemen. Uh, so, how many were there then in comparison to Germans? This was about four times many as there were German policemen in Ukraine. And these police auxiliaries played a key role in the Holocaust and other killings by intimidating, abusing, robbing, arresting, guarding, and sometimes personally murdering Jews. They also transported Jews from the countryside to major cities for questioning, which generally was followed by murder. And whenever ghettos were formed, these policemen tended to plunder and guard the Jews. The sad climax of their participation in the Holocaust came during the second half of 1942, when they drove the victims uh, to the killing site and stood guard there at the shooting pits. The level of involvement in these actions of the Ukrainian, of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists remains somewhat problematic, although it's increasingly clear that it was pretty substantial. We're talking here about the two factions of the OUN, one faction led by Stepan Bandera, also known as the Banderat, Banderivci, and the other faction was led by Andriy Melnik, known as the Melnikites. Uh, I can talk a bit about Kiev here, but I think I'll skip in the interest of time. Um, the relationship between these Ukrainian nationalists as activists and the Germans deteriorated quickly. Uh, first, in the summer of 1941, the OUNB, the Banderites, began to be persecuted, mainly because that faction refused to annul its declaration of Ukrainian statehood, which it had made, it had made in Lviv in June 1941. Uh, the OUNM, the Melnikites, which was particularly active in Kiev, was suppressed as well. But still, uh, many of these nationalists remained open to varying, de varying degrees to the possibility of cooperation with Germany. Partisans and German reactions. The Banderites mostly broke with Germany in early 1943, in particular after this organization set up a large Ukrainian insurgent army, UPA. Like so many other partisan forces in Europe during World War II, unfortunately, this UPA perpetrated massacres of innocent civilians, in this case, mainly ethnic Poles. This was in Western Ukraine. There were also Soviet partisans, of course. They made a big, big, big impact on everyday life as well, engaging in sabotage, distributing leaflets and newspapers, but at least as high on their agenda was killing, and not just of Germans. G Ukraine's NKVD even had as its official goal to, system to systematically exterminate the fascist regime in Ukraine. And it's clear to me and many other researchers that the Soviet partisans paid little or no attention to the consequences of their actions for locals. The predominant German reaction, here we see some policemen, by the way, the pre predominant auxiliaries in, on the right. The predominant German reaction to partisan activity will probably not surprise you now. It was to kill and to burn with careful planning, though, and with horrible precision. These are not killing sprees. They were well thought out, planned events. They killed eventually in these anti-partisan massacres some 50,000 people. Often in northern Ukraine, where sustained partisan activity was made possible by protection from the abundance of forests. Nevertheless, uh, uh, everywhere the Germans destroyed over 300 villages fully or in part. I'm skipping again some examples and now move to the very end the end of German occupation. The role of the SS in the German retreat, which began in 1943, was very true to type. 
Himmler, Heinrich Himmler agreed the land, he was talking about Ukraine, should be completely burned and destroyed. Land that they were evacuating. And he told the commanders of the Waffen SS in Kharkiv in April 1943 that any German retreat had to include Menschenvernichtung, the destruction of human beings. The Red Army crossed the Dnieper River in September 1943 and then quickly moved on further west. And I think it's fair to say that almost everywhere, in central Ukraine at least, the population received the Red Army soldiers with this pleasure. Uh, and of course, many of these soldiers themselves were Ukrainians. So to sum up, during World War II, the lands comprising Ukraine today underwent waves of unprecedented violence, deportations and killings produced by Soviet annexations, then death and trauma from German and Romanian regimes engaged in the Holocaust, deportation and anti-partisan warfare. And the impact of these war years has been felt in Ukraine ever since. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Karel, for this um, overview over uh, what has happened to Ukraine and the Ukrainians um, or the people living in Ukraine of different uh, national backgrounds uh, in these four years. I think we can um, uh, easily understand what the uh, current Ukrainian um, president meant when he said yesterday um, that um, they have their own story about uh, the liberation of Ukraine to tell. Um, I think we can open the floor for questions. I'm sure there are um, many um, in the room. Please um, give us a clear sign or stand up and then we will come with a microphone. I don't know, are there already questions from online people? Okay, so I, I, I can take this side. Okay. I have, I have a question. Uh, which organization is this black and red flag uh, related to? It's the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. Ukrainian yeah. Army. The, 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 the party, the, the, the organization, not the party. Yeah. There was another question. Uh, were the uh, Ukrainian auxiliaries not aware that they were the next target in the murder campaign or that they were? Uh, uh, in any case, deport, we're going to be deported if the Germans were to succeed? I don't think so. And uh, although it's hard to say because uh, there has not been any source base to, to study that, they didn't generally uh, volunteer to talk. Uh, they were interviewed sometimes later after the war uh, when it was done in the Soviet Union. They were defending themselves from accusations. Uh, and you, you can imagine that then they would have said, uh, I only joined because I feared for my life. But you actually, <coughs> mm, that's, that's another matter. Why did they join? And then what, they, what did they think as time progressed? Because that was the difference, right? Joining them, the, these units did not always mean to them initially that they would be engaged in extreme violence. That sometimes became clear only later. And then you see shifts in their attitude as the war changes and, and it becomes likely that the Germans will lose. But to generalize whether or not they were aware that they were mincemeat for the Germans later, it's hard, although I think they suspected and sensed the racism and, of course, saw how they treated uh, the non-Germans <coughs> in Ukraine. So, uh, yeah, they probably didn't see anything good in the long run coming from the Germans, to answer your question, uh, most basically. Any more questions? Online? Just <laughs> Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Uh, you mentioned there is a very extensive evidence of ethnic Ukrainians participating in the Holocaust. And I've been wondering whether 
this kind of research is publicly known in Ukraine? And if so, what has been the debate surrounding it? Yes, there is now, fortunately, finally, we're seeing an, uh, an increasingly large body of work that studies these policemen, because that's what you're talking about. In addition, there is research, and that really draws a lot of people's attention, research on these pogroms, which were carried out in, in a form of collaboration again, but then the, the non-Germans were these militiamen, or not even officially militiamen, but locals. Uh, and and uh, in a way, that's, that's a form of participation in what we now call the Holocaust. Uh, to say that uh, is already controversial, uh, uh, because it's seen as something that is sometimes overblown in proportion and so on. And uh, you can make an argument that these pogroms, looking at the scale of the victims, pale in comparison to the later massacres, but that doesn't make them less significant. As for the uh, massacres of carried out by Germans in 1942 and the deportations to Belgians and the role that Ukrainians as auxiliaries play, um, you know, it's it's known, but it's not often talked about. I mean, there are there's the infamous case of John Demjanjuk, who, uh, as you know, uh, very likely, almost certainly, was active in, in Sobibor and. Uh, you know, it's not welcomed. It's considered, certainly among some professional historians, there is an instant defensive reaction. What is on your agenda when you want to talk about this? Uh, are you not playing into the hands of our anti-Ukrainian enemies? So that's a very political response, which I certainly today you can understand, but it has been there for a long time. But uh, non-professional historians, perhaps not, not so uh, eager to defend, are, are sometimes surprisingly open to discussion about, about all of that. Certainly when you add that this, this is by no means a Ukrainian thing, it happened all over Europe. You always have to say it, and it's true, you know? It's not something where you Ukrainians stood out particularly badly. I always mention the Dutch case, all these Dutch men who went into the uh, Waffen-SS and so on. So. But it's fair to say overall that debate in public has not really grown into something big. I mean, compared to Poland, which has had huge waves of discussion, it's quite minimal. That's certainly the case, yeah. Are there more questions? Thank you very, very much. Um, I have a question regarding uh, the present. Uh, so, I, from what I understood, Ukraine has an anti-past, just as any other European country during the World War II, right? How does, how is that connected uh, with Putin's um, argument that he's coming to denazify the country? Like, how is this connected with his past? How is... Well, you have to... Uh, are you asking me to follow his line of reasoning, I suppose, <laughs> which uh, is not so difficult, uh, not so easy, I'm sorry. Uh, but um, what angers a man like that is the free debate about anti-Soviet partisans, anti-Soviet activists during German occupation. You know, these, by, in that kind of view, these people can only be traitors, nothing else. They're not worth even talking about of them having done anything good, they did, were not on our side. And as long as a country like Ukraine today does not completely ban this debate and uh, bans the books and, and proclaims in the school books that these are traitors, th th these people have become restless. What's going on? Uh, they're not facing the facts about Nazism because for them it's sort of the same. It used to be that in Soviet rhetoric, it was always fascism, right? But it's interesting that these days it's now Nazism, with which even Russians like Putin use to uh, denounce uh, these uh, evil uh, people, uh, to make it even worse, I suppose. I hope that answers your question a little bit. Are there more questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Um, you mentioned that um, included in the prisoners of war were British and French and um, people that were extremely likely to survive the captivity. In, in Western Europe, right? Yeah. But you said that um, even if they were Jewish, they were likely to uh, survive. But how would that be possible? The people in charge of those prisoners were not as adamant in the search for Jews among them. And uh, the, the killing uh, really, in this regard, focused on Eastern Europe. That was the main scene of anti-Jewish struggle among prisoners. Uh, th th it is, of course, surprising. You would think they would be searching these camps and definitely spending a lot of energy on tracing Jews among them, but they didn't. And I think the answer is probably <laughs> because uh, a lingering wish that um, maybe the confrontation with some of these countries could be switched. You know, uh, certainly Americans initially were not uh, in the war, as you know, they entered only later. And, uh, you know, uh, he wanted to keep his cards open and perhaps also uh, uh, not provide, uh, the Germans didn't want to provide further evidence of their crimes against Jews uh, by doing this in amongst all these foreigners who would tell. That's just pure speculation on my part, that second explanation. But it's little known, this, this contrast, and uh, <clears throat> the searches for Jews in these Soviet uh, masses was absolutely horrific. They would uh, have these large people all hungry uh, uh, fighting for food. And then somebody comes and says, uh, look, if you help us find Jews here, uh, you will be rewarded. And of course, there will always be some people who help out and uh, pull people's pants down and check and, and that kind of thing. Confiscate the boots when it's cold and you don't have a boot. It happened. Of, about these Soviet partisans, uh, uh, prisoners. Again, it's a topic like the Holocaust that has not been discussed a lot because of the um, <clears throat> lingering presence of the Soviet era prejudice against these prisoners. You know, as Stalin had said already during the war, it was a crime even to fall alive into the hands of the Germans. Why, why are you even alive, you know, after the war, the question would be. Um, you were supposed to die fighting uh, or at all costs attempt to cross the front line. So there was always this suspicion you were in these camps. How, how come you survived? Uh, so these people who did survive, it's not an insubstantial number, were not so eager to put it mildly to talk. And that's a real shame. We, we so much lack first person narratives of what it was like in these camps. You really have to look very hard. Uh, and uh, they took their stories mostly into their graves. So I fear a lot of it will never become clear. But um, eyewitness accounts from locals are very helpful sometimes. Uh, and um, going to people who live in the places today, and, you know, just go door to door and uh, ask about what did you know about the camp? The same methodology that has been used with great success for the Holocaust. Uh, there is an organization in France, Yahat in Unum, it's called, run by a Catholic priest who uh, did something that no historian uh, had thought of. Just take a camera and a recorder into villages and start asking around who saw the Holocaust uh, and then sit down with these people and just let them talk. Because the initial thought among the professional historians was there are virtually no living witnesses. And if they are there, but what will they be able to tell us that we don't know? It was a real prejudice, uh, partly based on a bigger prejudice among historians, unfortunately, against oral history. But that has really changed because when these stories were told by those people, 
uh, all kinds of new things came out. Uh, in particular, the incredible uh, openness of these mass shootings. It's by no means secret. You know, it's near their place of living uh, or a little further away. And there were always people involved forcibly or because they just wanted to see. So that really brought to light the methodology of these local mass shootings, which, uh, you know, we had suspected, but we now have a, have a much better picture of what it was like, how they organized it in every place. So I'm a big fan of oral history. I did it myself and, uh, you know, what sprang out right away, beatings. So I was happy in a way because, uh, you know, if it's only in, in some authorized memoirs, you sometimes wonder, are you exaggerating? But then these uh, oral confirmations are extremely uh, valuable. I, I always try to combine, of course, with, with other sources. I'd like to, to misuse my position here holding the microphone. But I hope if there are more questions that you sort of um, make yourselves known. But uh, in the light of what you just said, Karel, can I ask you, do you think we advanced further since, let's say, the wars in Yugoslavia and the um, attempts at organizing uh, transitional justice and transnational justice since then, in the light of what we've seen happening recently in Ukraine? Yeah, depends what the goal of transitional justice is. Uh, Ukraine threw out, open its archives pretty soon. And that was a very positive thing. And even today, I think, well, maybe not today, but the archives of the former KGB were open eventually. A huge contrast to Russia. So it means that many scholars even for that reason alone, started to focus on Ukrainian Soviet history. Um, well, for all the advancement in transitional justice, uh, focusing on, on this region of the world, it hasn't had many successes, to be fair. I mean, in Ukraine itself, there is, has always been a very polarized debate, um, often with little interest in how it's done elsewhere. Although, you know, there is this substantial group of intellectuals who is in the know and tries to inform people. It's useful to talk, you know, put it out in the open. But uh, as uh, my colleagues from the department probably agree, talking publicly about your private troubles is still somewhat, you know, people hesitate, you know, is it really of interest? Uh, would it not damage society even? They don't say it like that, but you know, am I not demoralizing all of us? Uh, revealing stuff about my own people that perhaps can be used against us. You know, there's a lot of fear for talking, but uh, looking at what's happening today, I, I then have to say I'm actually rather optimistic because there's this huge effort to record and uh, people do talk and find it absolutely normal to talk. We're quite in the midst of this horrible war and the record of it will be used. I'm absolutely convinced in tribunals that will be uh, able to use a flood of information. It's just incredible. So there, there I am optimistic. People know it's important to record as soon as possible and that's happening. I think we can take one last question if there's any. Um, speaking of topics closer to home, um, you mentioned Dutch troops being stationed in Ukraine. Um, have you come across any Ukrainian or Russian language sources that deal with this topic? Because I know of some research that um, has used Dutch and German sources, and I was wondering if there's any evidence of Dutch presence in more local sources, perhaps in those oral histories you've mentioned. I rarely encounter it. Uh, it appeared at the time in the Soviet press a little. They would capture a Dutch person and uh, explain what he did. Um, it was not a prominent thing in memoirs. I, I looked for it once, wrote an article about that. Uh, but um, no, it's, it's very 
they didn't distinguish them overall. There are stories of Dutch who uh, were actually themselves prisoners of war and had somehow ended up in Western Ukraine in German hands and then escaped in Galicia and then they encountered the uh, Ukrainian insurgent army. That's an interesting encounter because those partisans will say, hey, what, would you like to join our fight? And then uh, these Dutch would say, well, maybe it's not a good idea to fight against their own uh, people. But they went uh, back to the Netherlands and uh, somehow, somehow, somewhat spread the word. There are these Ukrainian partisans uh, fighting for their own uh, state. Okay, so uh, I think we, we have taken all questions. We have got um, very detailed answers. Thank you very much, Kai. And um, so I think we can close today's um, lecture. Thank you very much. Um, I remind you that we have the next lecture already in a week's time, and we'll be talking about Ukrainian literature uh, next week. You're all very welcome to join us again here in the lecture hall or online. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you.